down in Williamsport, there's this intersection of streets that come together. Now, I know you have a smaller one up here in Hanover Square, but this was huge. I think there was like seven or eight streets that came together, and I think they made this, the, the architects of this were just laughing, going, I can't wait to see what happens when all these cars come to this place at one time. And uh, we called it Confusion Corner, because anytime you drove out there, you had to think, wait a minute, where am I going? How do I get to where I'm going? I know when I got my first car, I was driving around just like any other kid, just wanted to go anywhere and see where I could go. And when I got out there, I did not know I was headed for this intersection, but I got there. And as soon as I got there, I froze. I sat at the stop sign, and I'm like, oh no, I have no idea how to get where I want to go. Now, I've been through that intersection hundreds of times as a passenger riding in someone else's car. But when I got there on my own, driving for the first time, I was really intimidated, kind of scared too. What I should have done was to, would have been to stop and think about where each road led ahead of time so that I could make that decision on how I could get to where I wanted to go. It's really confusing. If you ever have a chance, no, you don't want to go down there. An even better decision would have been to avoid going there altogether. But thinking back to confusion, uh, confusion corner got me thinking about how easily we as Christians can be distracted in our lives. One day we're going along just living the life that God has planned for us, and all of a sudden Satan throws something at us, the traps and temptations that he throws, the distractions, and it throws us off throws us into confusion, almost knocking us off that road that God's planned for us and the road that we were on. And why do we fall so easily for that? It's because we have this sin nature in us that lives in each one of our lives. See, we were born with a sinful nature and we inherited it from, from Adam. Romans 5.12 tells us this, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin... And in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. Every one of us has been affected by Adam's sins. There's no exceptions. Romans 5.18 tells us this. One trespass resulted in condemnation for all people. And see, we have to realize that we're all sinners. And we all share that condemnation because we're all children of Adam. We are born sinners. And for that reason, we are unable to do good in order to please God in our natural state or the flesh. Romans 8.8 8 tells us this, those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. See, because of this sinful nature, we sometimes feel that that compulsion to sin is greater and louder than God's gentle prodding to do what's right. There's a, there's a real, um, wow, I'm stumbling. <laughs> there's a real battle. Let's just face it. There's a battle that's going on in each of our lives. And in our hearts, and we have to, more often than we want to admit, that sin wins out. Sadly, I think that we uh, take sin too lightly sometimes, and we don't fully appreciate the gravity of our condition in the sight of God. God hates sin. And we have that sinful nature built in us. And what do we do with that? What we have to understand is that that is... Sin is a heart issue. We're going to stop and pray for a second. I'm, a, I'm wound up this morning, as you can't tell. I'm just going to stop and pray for a second. Father, just calm our nerves. May you just speak. Lord, may we just hear what you're saying to us today. And Lord, may it make a change in our lives. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Sin is a heart issue. Luke 6, 45 tells us this. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. See, unless a person's heart is touched and transformed by Christ, all the lists and laws in the world, whether the religious or civil laws, are powerless to keep us from sin. 
If we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, then we have the Holy Spirit to guide us and help us when we face those distractions that Satan throws at us. See, we either live that sinful nature or we trust in the Holy Spirit to help us through those times. It's one or the other. We need to make that decision to trust the Holy Spirit in all things. Even after we receive Christ in our heart, do we still have that sin nature? We do. The Bible tells us that it remains in us. And that's a struggle with that old nature will continue as long as we live in this world. Now, don't stay in that spot because I'm going to give you something better. But, and don't you just love that word, but, there's something better coming. Listen to this. But, we have some divine help. The Holy Spirit takes up residence inside of us and he gives us power to overcome that sin nature in us. We don't have to live in that anymore. It's gone. We trust him. We don't have to try to do it on our own. Because if we did, we'd fail every single time. But the Holy Spirit helps us to see the sin in our lives and gives us the power over that sin. Now, think back. Has there been one thing that Satan has been throwing at you over and over again? Think back. He uses things over and over. And just when we think that we've conquered that and we don't do it on our own, through the power of the Holy Spirit, he brings it back again. That's how he does things. We need to keep continuing trust, putting trust in the Holy Spirit. So the question we need to answer today is this. How do we conquer that sinful nature that resides in each one of us? Good question. I know somebody out there asked that question. So we're going to look at Galatians chapter 5. We're going to start, we're going to look at a small passage in that, verses 16 to 25 today. And we're going to answer that question. Verse 16 says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. See, walking by the Spirit means that we need to take step by step, and moment by moment, like Donnie said, every single moment, trusting God. Trusting that where he leads us is the best place and how he is giving us the wisdom to do things, that we just trust him with everything. It means that when he leads, we follow. As he speaks, we listen and we obey what he is telling us. The Holy Spirit way is a path of surrender. We need to surrender our lives completely, like Donnie said. Thank you, Donnie. You know, I love how God does that, how he brings the, the message and the songs perfectly together. Those words were no, no more truer than anything. God is amazing how he does things. Every single day, we need to surrender our lives to him and let him lead. He's got great things planned for each one of us if we only let him lead. See, we can't overcome that sinful uh, nature on our own. It's that moment by moment that we need to give to him. There's a song, it, it, it always, he does this, he always gives me a song. I don't know how many of you out there know that song, Moment by Moment. Now, the, the author of this um, was actually uh, at a revival meeting, and he heard this pastor up there saying, you know what, I need thee every hour. I love that song, but it's not good enough. And this guy went and wrote this song, Moment by Moment, because that's, how we need to live our lives, moment by moment, trusting in God. Listen to these words. Dying with Jesus by death reckoned mine, living with Jesus, a new life divine, looking to Jesus till glory doth shine, moment by moment, O Lord, I am thine. Never a trial that he is not there, never a burden that he does not bear, never a sorrow that he does not share. Moment by moment, I'm under his care. Never a heartache and never a groan. Never a teardrop and never a moan. Never a danger, but there on the throne, moment by moment, he thinks of his own. And one more verse. Never a weakness that he doth not feel. Never a sickness that he cannot heal. Moment by moment, in woe or in weal, Jesus, my Savior, abides with me still. 
And listen to the chorus. I love the chorus. Moment by moment, I'm kept in his love. Moment by moment, I've life from above. Looking to Jesus till glory does shine. Moment by moment, O oh Lord, I am thine. I think that's a prayer that we should have in our lives. It's, I know it's a song, but I think that's a prayer. Lord, moment by moment, I trust you completely. I give you I surrender my day to you. I surrender my life to you. And I know that you've got great things planned. And I just trust whatever it is that you've got planned for me. Verse 17. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not, you are not able to do what you want. So you are not to do what you want. If I could read, that would be awesome. Paul is telling us there's an internal conflict within each one of us. The sinful nature and the Holy Spirit are at war in our hearts. And we know this. There's a guy named Carl Sandburg who puts it a different way to help us try to understand it. He said, there's an eagle in me that wants to soar, and there's a hippopotamus in me that wants to wallow in the mud. And I'm thinking, okay, we gotta, we got to get this figured out. What exactly is he saying? So the hippopotamus is our flesh, which is sinful by nature, that wants to live in the sin Nature and that only pulls us down away from God. And that eagle soaring is a soul that is uh, free from the bondage of sin because the Holy Spirit has given us power over that sin. I love that. I, I, it's the first time I had ever heard it. And I love that. I love as we trust in Him what He does in our lives. So if we depend on our flesh, we end up sinning every time because that's our nature. Now there was a guy named Dr. Uh, Lauren Nordgren, who conducted this series of tests, he tried to put these college students uh, in tempting situations to try to get them to smoke or eat junk food or not study. The research found that we often display what's called a restraint bias. In other words, we tend to overestimate how much self-control we will have when temptation is put in front of us. Our restraint bias causes us to think we can handle more temptation than we actually can. In fact, Dr. Nordgren warned that those who are most confident about their self-control are the most likely to give in to temptation. Let's, what does that mean to us? What can we learn from that study? That we should not put confidence in ourselves to overcome the sin. We can't do it on our own. We shouldn't depend on our own strength because we know where that leads. It pulls us down away from God. But instead, we need to depend upon the Holy Spirit's power to help us through them. And I know I've said that about 10 times so far, to trust the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to say it about 100 more times during this sermon, because it's that important. Do we want to live like the world is telling us to live? Do we want to live in that sinful nature, which is part of us? Or do we want to live a life that is honoring and pleasing to God? And we can't do that on our own. I'm going to give you an illustration. Okay, let's hope this works. <laughs> okay, here we go. This is our sinful nature. Okay, this book. Rachel, it's not what the book is. It's just the book. Okay, so this arm is actually the Holy Spirit. Okay, let me come out. So the Holy Spirit is holding us up. Now listen, gravity, if I were to let this go, it was going to hit, right? The sin nature wants to pull us down away from God. And the only thing stopping us is the Holy Spirit holding us and helping us and sustaining us. But if we don't have the Holy Spirit in our lives, if we let the sin nature take over, what happens? We're pulled down. We're pulled away from God. And there's nothing worse than being pulled away from God. cannot let that happen in our lives. When we depend on the Holy Spirit's power, we conquer the cravings of the flesh. There was a man named Robert Cook who had this radio broadcast who every day he would say on there over and over again, pray your way through the day. And he would say this a million times, pray your way through the day. And I want to say that to us today. 
Every time you're feeling tempted, every time Satan is throwing something at you, every time you're feeling the weight of the world pressing in on you, stop and pray. Every time that you're feeling Satan attacking and he's going to hit you over and over again, stop and pray. Every decision you make, every temptation that you face, like that song, moment by moment. You know, I know some people get up in the morning and they say, Lord, I give you this day, but I know that's not the end of it. They go through every part of their day thanking the Lord for what he's doing in their lives. And I'm one of the people I love to do that. You know, when you, when you see things that are happening in someone's life and you just praise God because he's taking such good care of others. And, and we are doing that too because he's giving us those opportunities to help people. I just love how he does things. But we have to depend on him in all things. Verse 18, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Those who follow the spirit have a better way of living than those who try to follow the law. We don't need to live under the law anymore because Jesus came, right? Now we can be led by the Spirit. Now I was debating whether I should tell you this story or not, but before I came to New York many moons ago, um, I could not cook anything. and I was on my own. I thought, oh man, I could do simple things like hamburgers and hot dogs. Anybody can throw them in a pan and eat. But I had to... Uh, learn. I tried to pick things up from doing a recipe, and I never could do it. It never turned out right. So I started paying attention to my mom when she did things. She never used a cookbook. She always took things and just put them in there and seasoned them right, and they always came out good. But I couldn't do it. And I came here to New York, and I think that uh, when I lived over uh, above Cappy's, I think uh, the McDonald's right there was my favorite place because I would always get the number one, the Big Mac meal, and that's what sustained me the whole time. Now, Anna's tried to teach me a few things, and, and I think she's done great. She's taught me how to be a good cook, and I think I can cook now. But the thing is, I'm no longer confined to that cookbook. That's what I'm trying to get at. Those rules in that book to, to make something, because of my mom, because of Anna, I can do things now that I couldn't do before. I'm under a better system now. That's exactly what the believer has in the Holy Spirit. We know, we who know Christ are no longer confined to the law, the do's or the don'ts. We're under a better system. We have the Holy Spirit to guide us through the process of living a, a holy life, a life that is honoring and pleasing to God. And all we have to do is listen and follow what he says. We're going to look at verses 19 through 21 as a, as a whole. But before we do, we have to remember one thing. God doesn't look at sin the way that we look at sin. See, we, we think that, well, my sin wasn't as serious as someone else's. We try to rationalize and make ourselves feel better. But that's not what God says, and that's what, not what his word says. Listen to James 2.10. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. See, God doesn't rank sin because he's holy. And he wants us to live a holy life, blameless to him. We're going to get hit with temptations, but it's how we deal with those temptations and, and whether we fall into that sinful nature or whether we call out to the Holy Spirit and say, help us. Let's look at those verses, 19 through 21. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. See, we all have the evil desires that we must not ignore. We've got to deal with them. How do we deal with them? We need to crucify them on that cross. We can't continue to live with that sinful nature guiding us. So here are four steps to help you with those selfish desires. The first thing is to admit that you have a selfish, sinful nature, and don't be too shocked or proud to acknowledge that you have one. The second one is to surrender all your bad tendencies to Christ. 
He knows what you're dealing with. And you know, often we say, I've heard people say, I don't know how to pray. I don't know what to say to him. It's a conversation from your heart to him. Giving him everything. You know, let's make 2021 a time when we start out right and we just lay every burden down like we were singing earlier. Lay your burdens down. Give them to him. He wants to hear what we're going through. He knows what we're going through, but he wants to hear it from our lips. Give it to him and trust him with it. Commit your actions, thoughts, and passions and capabilities to Christ, asking the Holy Spirit to help you restrain your evil desires and angry reactions. We know that Satan likes to attack over and over, and he hits us when we're the weakest and when we're tired and when we're uh, just worn out, when we're discouraged. And he's going to use those tactics over and over. But we have the Holy Spirit to help us, to strengthen us, to get us through those temptations. And the last one is making serving others a top priority. When we see the hurts and needs of others, it helps take that self-focus away and all that we're dealing with and really caring and loving for people. Loving people. Isn't that what God told us to do is to love others? That's the key to who he is, love. Love others. I love the message. If, if you've ever seen one of our checks from the church, it says, we all need Jesus. And I've thought about that over and over. We all need Jesus. So important, so true. What a beautiful reminder for us to look beyond ourselves and to share the message of Christ's love with everyone we meet. So just... I find it easier to put ourselves in their shoes at times and say, you know, if I needed someone, would they be there for me? Think about how you would wish that someone would tell you about Jesus and, and how much they are loved. Think about it. Is there someone out there today that you could share Christ's love with? Someone that may have never heard his name. Maybe it's in your own family. Maybe it's in your neighborhood. Maybe it's where you work. Maybe it's in your schools that are going back tomorrow, some of them. Share the message of Christ's love with them. Knowing how people are seeking for answers during these troubled times. This past year has been crazy. We need to put our trust in God because everyone needs Jesus. So what are we doing with this knowledge that we have of knowing that this sinful nature is going to drag us down away from God? What are we doing? Are we living in that sinful nature? Or are we trusting the Holy Spirit to help us break this pattern in our lives? See, it can hurt. That sinful nature can hurt us so badly in so many ways. Most importantly, let's look at what the worst consequence is. Galatians 5.21 I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Wow, that's the worst thing that could happen to us. We all want to go to heaven. God wants us all to go to heaven, to spend eternity with him. And I look forward to spending my eternity in heaven someday with him. But giving into that sinful nature will lead us in the opposite direction, will take us away from him. We need to break that pattern right away, right now. How important is it for us to allow the Holy Spirit to guide us and help us when faced with sin in our lives? See, if we claim we have accepted Jesus, our lives are going to demonstrate a real change, and people will pay attention, and they'll see that change is evident in how we react to people and how we deal with the, the problems and trials that we face in life in our life. And I can almost hear Rip right now. Rip, I know you're out there and you're, you're saying, tell them the best part, tell them the good part of trusting in the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to get there right now. When we surrender our lives to the Holy Spirit, look at verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit, this is what your life can look like if you trust in the Holy Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, Gentleness and self-control, against, against such things there is no law. Don't you want those qualities in your life? 
that joy and that peace that comes from knowing who he is, from trusting him with your life. Finally, and most importantly, verse 24. Pay attention to this verse. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh, that sinful nature, with its passions and desires. In order to live for Christ, we need to turn from our sins and willingly nail our sinful nature to the cross. It doesn't mean that we're never going to have uh, desires, evil desires again. As Christians, we still have the capacity to sin. but We have been set free from sin's power over us and no longer have to give in to it. We must daily commit our sinful tendencies to God's control, daily crucify them, and moment by moment draw on the Spirit's power to overcome them. See, we can't do it alone. I'll tell you now, Satan will, if he's not attacking you now, he will be attacking you soon. That's what he does. He wants to take you away from God. And it's your decision whether you allow him to by his distractions and his lies. He's the master deceiver, and he will do anything to separate you from trusting God, to keep you from trusting God. As the team comes to close, let me just say this. As we begin this new year, let's make it the very best year that we can. Let's deal with this sinful nature right now. Let's not waste any more time. Let's not ruin any more of our lives. Let's nail it to the cross. Let's crucify it today. And just like that confusion corner I told you about earlier, we all have the decision to make. Where do you want to go? Do you want to go, go along with the world and, and live in that sin? If you do, your eternity is not pretty. There's, as the Bible describes it, there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Think of it this way, endless pain and sorrow. It never ends. But the worst part is you'll be separated from God forever. That's what hell is like. Or we can make the decision that we want to go to heaven, that we want to live our lives trusting God, letting the Holy Spirit lead us and help us with this sinful nature. And then with that, we, we just read what our life can be like, that joy and peace that can overflow into everyone around us. A place where there's no more sorrow and no more pain. I look forward to that day. I cannot wait until we can go to heaven and live with our Father in heaven. And to see those people that we've read about in the Bible. And to see my family again. It begins with that moment by moment surrender. So what will you do? Where will you go? It's your choice. Today can be a new day for you. If you've had things that Satan has been attacking you with and you keep falling over and over, it doesn't have to end like that. 2020 can go be behind you. 2021 is new, and today's a new day for you. You can put your trust in the Holy Spirit. You can trust God with your life and let him lead you to a path uh, that he has planned for your life that will take you to an eternity in heaven. Just got to trust him. If you don't know who he is, please talk to someone today. Please find out how much God loves you and how much he wants to, to help you through these terrible attacks that Satan is giving. He's tempting you. It can end Today, Now, are you going to still be tempted? Absolutely. But we have a way of getting through that by trusting that the Holy Spirit will help us through that. Where will you go today?